Elsa, go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you, Mike. Hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm Elsa Huxley from Heritage Preservation, and we are so glad that you're joining us today. Heritage Preservation is moderating the Connecting to Collections online community in cooperation with the American Association for State and Local History and with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The site is designed and produced by Learning Times, who are producing this event today. The goal of the online community is to help smaller museums, libraries, archives, and historical societies quickly locate reliable preservation resources and network with their colleagues. In developing the community, we have drawn on many resources that were developed for the Connecting to Collections initiative, including the Connecting to Collections bookshelf and the Raising the Bar workshops and webinars. And we have links to those resources filed under the Topics menu on the site, which is again at connectingtocollections.org. We will also be filing uh, that recording of today's webinar there if you want to share it with colleagues in the future. About twice a month, uh, the Connecting to Collections online community features a particularly helpful preservation resource, and we host a webinar related to it. The resources that we posted for today's webinar can be accessed by um, clicking this photo on our web page, not in this presentation, or by going directly to the web page at connectingtocollections.org. So today, we want to welcome Barbara Cumberland, who is a conservator, the conservator of Museum, and Conser Museum Conservation Services at the Harpers Ferry Center at the National Park Service, and Carol DeSalvo, Integrated Pest Management Coordinator at the National Park Service. And I want to thank them for taking the time to answer your questions today. Barbara and Carol, would you like to say a few words? Sure, this is Carol. Thanks, Elsa. I'll start off. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Elsa and Mike, for having us. Um, this is a real treat for me to be on the phone doing this, because I love this type of interaction, and it's nice to hear what the field's working on. Um, I've been with the National Park Service, oh gosh, almost 30 years now, and in the Integrated Pest Management Program. And our main mission for this program is to reduce risks from pests and pest management-related strategies. So my job involves all different types of pest issues that come up you know, through the phone or through technical assistance requests um, from all different types of areas, from you know, bed bugs to weeds to skunks, uh, all types of different things. Um, and of course, the museum pest world. Um, we have to manage things in accordance with federal law and policy. Um, and we try to come up with the lowest risk and most effective management strategy and really try to find the actual problem um, that's causing the, the pest issue rather than just treat the symptoms. Um, I have always enjoyed working with the museum folks because they seem to right away grasp this concept because they know if something gets damaged, that's it. You know, the damage is there. You can't go replace it. It's a one-of-a-kind type item usually. And through this work, I've met Barbara Cumberland, and she has become the museum pest expert. I deal with all different types of stuff, but Barbara, we go to her for our specific issues. And the one thing we do share in common is we both enjoy these little critters and things that are affecting our items. Um, and we'll go through this um, step process in a little while, but we both do appreciate the little lies of these critters that are, are in our museum collections. So Barbara? Uh, hi, how are you? Um, yeah, I have been working uh, for the National Park Service at Harpers Ferry Center in the museum conservation labs for museum conservation services since 1988. And uh, what we do here in my job in general is we have conservators that uh, do conservation treatments on museum objects from national parks from all over the country. Um, the majority of them are from things going on exhibit in the national parks, either in a conventional museum exhibit or a historic furnished building or that kind of thing. And um, one of, one of the big uh, preservation issues is um, damage from museum pests. Uh, it's one of the agents of deterioration that we talk about. And uh, I, I've just noticed that a lot of the things that we do need to do hands-on conservation treatments on, you know, especially our textile conservator, an awful lot of time and effort goes into repairing damage from uh, things like clothes moths and carpet beetles on, on you know, flags and woolen uniforms and different things like that. 
and you know we also see it with our furniture conservators working on things with um, uh, wood boring beetle holes in them. Um, so sometimes things come into the conservation labs with these problems or with active infestations, and we have to do something about it and prevent them, the pests from going on other objects. And uh, otherwise, um, I, I've kind of become the integrated pest manager uh, coordinator for our conservation labs building. That involves doing pest monitoring and a lot of things that we'll be talking about today. And uh, it, it's just become a, a real interest of mine. And I've, I've had the opportunity to actually travel to different national parks and help them with um, integrated pest management plans for their museums and seen such a wide variety of problems that uh, it's, it's just really interesting to uh, try to come up with safe um, management solutions to these kind of issues. We'll be talking a little bit, little bit about that today. So that briefly, that's my background. I'm a, I'm an objects conservator, um, and I, I work on a variety of materials, anything from metal to leather. Um, uh, fiber and, and all different kind of things. So anyway, I'll be showing you some pictures of things, too. So thanks. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Carol and Barbara. I know this is going to be a very interesting conversation, and some of those pictures are really disturbing. Here we go. I will be pulling <laughs> over a poll. Um, it's actually not a poll. It's a general question for everyone to start us off. We'd like to know what your biggest pest problem is. Fill in that blank at the bottom there. Dirt daubers. What are dirt daubers? Blood daubers. <laughs> dirt daubers. I, I'm thinking that those are probably um, mud dauber wasps. OK. Um, huh, bees in the wall. Interesting. Of variety. <laughs> OK. Thank you, Angela. Yep. Does all of this sound like what you would be expecting, Barbara? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. more. <laughs> Look, looks familiar. <laughs> those little flying bl black bugs. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, those are bad. <laughs> They're innocent until proven guilty, however. You'll find that Carol will, at every opportunity, stick up for the bugs and <laughs> <laughs> and their and their right to live out in nature. And I will say yes, but keep them out of our museums. Which links us to this webinar as to the conditions conducive to pests. Mm -hmm. You folks have quite a good list here. I would like a list, a copy of this list. I will be saving it. I'll pull it off of the screen, but it will be saved in the background. So we can Great. pull it back up, and we can definitely copy and paste and keep it for later. All right. All right, everybody, thank you so much for these responses. I'm going to pull this away. And I'm going to pull up now the conservagram that's the basis for our conversation today. It's um, been posted on the Connecting to Collections website. And it should be downloadable, too. Um, as I pull this over, you'll see an icon in the left corner that has a disk. And you should be able to capture it there, if you like. Um, Barbara, Carol, did one of you want to say something about this? It should be pulling up right uh, now. Yeah. Yes, this, this is um, one of the conservagrams put out by the National Park Service. and. Uh, and they are all available on the internet. And there, aside from this one, there are a number of others that do have to do with um, pest issues and pesticide issues, um, pesticides that have been used in museum collections before. So when you get into the National Park Service Conservagram website, um, I, I think most of the um, let's see, Mo most of the conservagrams dealing with pests are in 
sections um, three and also section two, which has to do with uh, curatorial safety. Um, so um, anyway, this, this is a, a very nice conservogram that has some good color photos and uh, a brief description of the kind of museum pests that a lot of you are, are likely to deal with. So it, it's a good introduction into um, identifying the damage from these kind of museum pests. I hope you all get a chance to read it. And I just posted um, the URL for the table of contents for your conservagram. Thank you. In the chat box. Yeah, it's a really good resource. Um, and you'll find a lot of, as I said, a lot of um, ones having to do with pesticides and pests in sections uh, two and three. Section three is on agents of deterioration. Okay, I could pull over the IPM authorities if you're ready for that. Sure, that sounds good. Um, we'd like to show you our list of IPM authorities. And we put this together for our National Park Service managers, but many of these things, most of them apply to everybody. Um, we, like most organizations, have to operate under certain authorities and rules and regulations. So this is a not a 100% complete list, but a pretty good list that we updated recently in this um, January, I guess it was. Um, on the different types of laws, regulations that we have to follow when we're managing any type of pest issues. Um, and under the Federal Fungicide, Insect, Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, that's the top one there, is kind of the, the key law that established this whole integrated pest management um, effort. And it was also supported through the 1979 Presidential Memorandum through President Carter. And the whole IPM story started because after World War II, we had an awful lot of pesticides available, and they were used you know, everywhere to manage pest issues. And they were very effective, but then we started seeing negative effects to people, our resources, and the environment. And that's when the breaks kind of came on. You know, Silent Spring with Rachel Carson came out um, earlier and made everybody alert to what's going on. So this is just a list that everybody can kind of use as a guide um, as to why we use this integrated pest management approach. But the key reason we use it is, in fact, it works. And we'll talk a little bit about the IPM process in the next uh, few minutes here. Thanks, Elsa. OK. Oh, you're welcome. I'll pull over the 11-step process next. So the 11-step process that's coming up next is um, it's pretty much a decision-making process. It's common sense written down in 11 steps, essentially. Um, we put this together with the Fish and Wildlife Service, and many other agencies use it. If you look on any extension website from any community or state college, um, everybody has some sort of a step process on IPM. We happen to have 11 steps, and that's what we're going to go over here. But we're not going to go over each and every one because it will take forever. And those of you who have been in our class on the National Park Service and know that, know that we do this for a whole week. So Barbara and I thought we would focus on a couple of key points that have to do with this particular webinar. So the first step, which is really important, is you have to know your site management objective and figure out what your short and long-term priorities are. Because for instance, if you have mice running through the museum, you have to get rid of the mice immediately, and the long, maybe through snap trapping. And the long-term thing would be to figure out how to exclude them permanently. But there's times you have to take quick action and then plan for the future. Um, the next step is build consensus. Of course, you have to have everybody in place. Um, you have to have everybody on board, or you're not going to get anywhere. You need to have consensus. Um, always document section three, your actions. Number four is very important, and we are going to elaborate on that one, which is to know your resource. You are responsible for whatever type of museum situation you're in or artifacts. Um, and you have to know that resource intimately. You must know everything about the site that you store it in. You must know how things come in and out. You have to know what type of material you have. And Barbara has some great slides on that. But you have to look at your building or your site as a living system. Because inside that building, even inside each little display case, there's its own little site ecology. Um, how, air, how air flows, how heat and air come in and out, or cool air, um, what the material is made out of, what your little critter or fungus or whatever the pest is, what they need to survive. You have to know everything about them, where they like to hide, what they like to eat, who may be a predator on them, um, if they're a symptom or if they're actually a cause of the problem. 
So we'll focus on number one, number four, and then the next one, number five, know your pest. And that's the one we're going to really focus on in this webinar. Um, our definition of pest is something that's interfering with your site management objectives. So once you know what you're supposed to be responsible for, if it's, if it's interfering with that action or your, that responsibility, it's considered a pest. Um, critters or fungus or whatever the pest is could be a pest in one situation and not in another. Depends on all the site characteristics. So you know, you're a pest here, but you may not be a pest there. But we must know that and remember that these little things that are called pests are doing what nature intended them to do. So the fact that they're affecting our items means we've given them a condition where they are happy and want to pursue their little, you know, biology that they have to employ. So it's our job to figure out how to make it non-conducive for them. So we'll look at what type of potential pest species we have, know their biology, and the conditions conducive to support the pest. Uh, number six is very important monitoring, so you figure out if you're getting anywhere with your actions. Um, and not just the pest population, we're also going to monitor environmental fact excuse me, factors and other things that are happening in that site. Um, number seven, establishing action thresholds. Figure out at what point no additional damage can, uh, can happen or you're going to lose the resource. So you have to figure out how much you can tolerate or not. And often in the museum world, your, your action tolerance is, your, your threshold is zero because you have that one item that's unique. Um, action thresholds are different in different types of situations, such as like natural wild areas. Step eight, um, Barbara will touch on a couple of those things, and I'll chime in as well, different management tools that are available. We try to pick out, review all the tools available, and then pick out the best ones that are going to help to manage that situation. Um, sometimes physical strategies will be better, or cultural strategies, biological control agents possibly, or, or chemical pesticide strategies. So there's different types of strategies available, and we have to identify which would be the best complex of those. And using them together is the integrated approach with all these other steps. Number nine is important, very important. You have to define who's going to do what. Because um, if you don't, people don't know who's taking care of what aspect of this pest management strategy. If you have someone taking care of the building, say uh, maintenance staff, they, know, they need to know where your snap traps are put. They need to know if you have a leak somewhere because that's creating moisture. So you have to really involve the right people. And things need to be carried out in accordance with policy. Um, number 10, of course, you must evaluate how you're doing your results and modify the strategy if necessary to reach your goals and protect your resource. And number 11 is pretty much what we're doing today, education and outreach and continue the learning cycle. So it's great to see all the examples you guys gave because that helps us to see what else is happening in the field, what's you know, new and different, and we, we learn from each other. OK, that's it, Elsa, thanks. OK. Um. We have one or two questions that have come in now. I wonder if we could address those before we went into the presentation. Um, here, I'll put this one from Peter Olson asking about if there's some sort of a poster that pictures typical pests. Are you aware of something like that that we could share? Uh, and if yeah, yes, we are. Um, there is a a good poster with illustrations of of many of the museum pests available from a company called Insects Limited, which is also on the internet. And the poster can be ordered ordered from insectslimited.com, I think it is. And I think we might have, um, there might be a, a link to that on on this program. Okay, I'll today. find it and put it up. Oh, there. Yes. Yeah, that, that's the poster that comes to mind for me. Yeah, Insects Limited has a lot of other great items for, for museum issues. Um, I think we listed some of them in that reference. OK. And then we have one more question here. Mike, is that OK if I put that one up here? Go. Um, from Eloise Warren, can you see that? Um, it did, and it went away. But hi, Eloise. Yes. It's Carol. How you doing? <laughs> I, I see it. Uh, it um, hi, we are looking to learn more about possible treatments for webbing and case-making clothes, moth infestation in upholstered antique vehicles. Is there anything more effective and comprehensive than our current vacuuming and freezing, removing seats and mats to place in the freezer? And is there anything out there that could provide residual protection? Uh, I, I have an idea about that. Um, I. 
was recently doing an integrated pest management plan, museum integrated pest management plan for one of our parks that had that problem, except it wasn't the clothes moss. They had um, carpet beetles eating their upholstery in the antique vehicle. And I suggested and uh, I suggested if possible that they could roll it out of the garage into the sun on one of those hottest days of the year. And you know how on the hottest days of the year how the interior of a vehicle can get very, very hot inside. And uh, heat is also a way of, of killing um, most insects. If, it, if you can get, get the temperature inside the vehicle like over 120 degrees, um, which, which is common on these really, really hot days like we're getting in the east right now and in the Midwest too. <laughs> um, you should, that, that might be a, a good thing to think about. Um, I, you know, I don't know if that's a possibility with, with your antique vehicles, but it, you know, again, it's something to think about. Your vacuuming uh, and freezing, you know, just keep, keep on vacuuming and do that and, uh, you know, freezing, that, that would kill the insects also. Um, and y you might also get a, a clothes, mo clothes moth pheromone lure and put it in, put a couple of those inside the vehicles that would, you know, ho hopefully attract any of the, um, adults before they lay more eggs. Uh, that might be another thing. Carol, can you think of any? No, nope, I think hand? those are, that's what I would come up with. I think those are great, excellent ideas. And the idea of parking things in the sun is a good idea. It would get most of them. I think the, a lot of them, though, would try to migrate where it's cooler. And those little microhabitats that you still might have resi residual little populations. So um, it would definitely knock out the majority, though, for sure. You know, hopefully um, that might be a possibility where their vehicle could be moved out into the sun. You know, this this type this time of year. We have a question about pheromone traps. Yes, uh, there there are pheromone lures available that. Um, Rather than like a passive sticky trap, they would actively draw certain insects in. It, it, it's more or less a bait, and it's species specific. And pheromone traps are available for some of the museum pests, like I think uh, both case-making clothes moths, wet, webbing clothes moths, um, several of the, the dermestid species, um, like uh, varied carpet beetle, black carpet beetle, uh, trugoderma, which is like a cabinet beetle, um, I think drugstore beetle, which is a cellulose eating pest, and maybe, and I think cigarette beetle, which is also a cellulose eating pest, um, they, they could be used. Um, in, in like museum storage or in a museum exhibit, you'd want to put it at, su at a, you know, a far distance from the, the doors and windows just so you, you know, wouldn't attract anything from outside and, you know, just kind of have it like in a, in a museum storage room, maybe not right up against the objects, but you know, just outside in the room. Um, and, and yeah, that, that's something that is used in museums. Okay, I, I see you're, you're thinking about them for moths. So yeah, th they do have the pheromones for webbing clothes moth and case making clothes moths. And they're also available from that company, Insects Limited. Um, they're just the, seem to be the major supplier of pheromone lures that I'm aware of. 
guess we might add um, that you know, if you have these traps set up, don't rely on them 100%, though, because um, you still need to do other methods to make sure you're not getting damage and monitoring and all that. But it is a great yeah. tool. Yeah, and they are basically intended as a monitoring trap, although they can provide some degree of control by attracting you know, the insects into the trap so they're not alive anymore. I, I, I see that you're bringing up, um, are, are we going to another question or did you want to go to the um, slides that are coming up on the screen? Since we have another question up now, let's answer that one. And then we have okay. the slides. And we can start going through the slides. But I just I want to encourage the audience that if you have questions that occur to you as we're going through this, to keep putting them in. Um, we'll address some of them as we go through. And some at, we will reserve for, some we'll for get after. Back yeah, yeah. Okay. But here we have this one about bed bugs. Could you address that one? Bed bugs, my favorite. Okay. <laughs> um, I can. Email your stuff if you like, but then I'll tell you right off the bat, there's a great website. It's called bedbugcentral.com, and it's um, one of the best ones we've found. We've had the proprietor of this site teach us in the National Park Service the best strategies for managing bed bugs. Um, there are little traps called interceptor traps, which are normally used on beds. And essentially, there's no chemical involved. They're just smooth surfaced cups, and they go underneath your bed legs, and the critters can't get up to the bed. Um, the bed bug, there are some other bed bug traps that are very expensive where they actually give off carbon dioxide and you can you know, attract bed bugs to it. But the whole thing with bed bugs is really education. And um, it's pretty much a whole gigantic talk into itself. But there are some traps out there. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of a really big topic to get into. The good thing is that they do not transmit any disease. They're more of a icky type thing. And they have reemerged because of the resistance to current pesticides that we were using. And in the past, we did a lot of baseboard treatment for cockroaches, and that also got the bed bugs. Well, we don't do that anymore due to health issues. So the bed bugs have resurged. And um, the heat treatment works great. There are portable ovens you can purchase, which are also on that website. Um, I have a friend who's every time his son comes home from college, he dumps everything from the kid on the back porch into his oven, plugs it in outside. It's a foldable oven. Heats everything the kid owns before he is allowed back in the house, because they've had bed bugs before in the, in the dorm. Um, I'd be glad to, I don't know, send information if you want to send us an email, but it's kind of a really big topic to get into now. OK, thanks. Should we start going through the presentation? Uh, yes, let's do that. OK, um, I'll start flipping through these uh, pictures up on your screen. Um, the first uh, title page. Uh, happens to show a, a rug from one of our presidential homes that has been plagued with case-making clothes moths. And, and the person is pointing to the actual uh, larval case that the, um, the moth larva leave behind. And on the, the right of the screen, you can see where the, where the carpet has been damaged. And uh, it's just. Uh, a big problem because it's such a large, a very, very large carpet that they have. And so it's difficult to find a, a freezer to, to freeze it. And they've, they've vacuumed and vacuumed. And, and um, anyway, they've used freezing and vacuuming as a strategy on this particular item. And I, I, I just want to flip through a couple of pictures showing some examples of the kind of things we're trying to avoid in museums. Um, uh, on the bottom, there's um, damage by a, a dermestid beetle larva to a, the base of a, a horn of a, um, a sheep. And it's actually eaten into the horn itself, uh, which is a, the keratin material that the um, the carpet beetles and the hide beetles like to eat. Above that is something that has come into our conservation lab, a chair that they found that a, there was a dead mouse inside of it. And, um, and, and had decomposed, and it had been nesting inside the chair. And that, in turn, um, attracted 
other insect pests. Um, it, it attracted more of these germested beetles, which I'll be talking about. Their um, protein-eating pests. Um, and to the right, there's a, a picture of a, a book where um, an insect has tunneled through all of the pages and eaten them out. And at first, I thought it had been done by a drugstore beetle that I, I've heard that they burrow through books. But then, since then, I've seen that that kind of pattern of damage is pretty typical of um, termites, that, um, that you know, termites can come up from the ground and into a box that's sitting on, you know, in contact with the ground and work its way up through and eat books and, and wood and other things. If we had a really close-up of that, we could tell if it is termites, because then they would leave the frass behind or their excrement or the stuff they chew out and spit out. I um, think there was some frass. And then it probably yeah. is. OK. Yeah. Um, then uh, na natural history collections are, are very vulnerable to um, many pests. And the top shows examples of feathers that have been eaten by case-making clothes moths that have actually left those little white casings from their larva behind. And you can see all the loss in the feathers. And there's, there were two um, of these below uh, butterfly specimens mounted between pieces of glass. And in the one on the left, um, uh, varied carpet beetles got in there and have destroyed the specimen. They, they just consumed it. And it would just continue to be consumed because it was still alive in there until we put it through a freezing treatment. Just so the specimen is gone, but it's a really good example to show. Um, going back to the 11-step process, could I um, interrupt for one second? I'm sorry, it's Alpha. I just um, I noticed that we had a question about clothes moths. And the photo on the preceding slide of the feathers, I think, was from clothes moth. Damage. I thought this That's might be right. a good opportunity to answer that one. What is the question? Um, the question is, what do you do when you have an entire collection that is infested with clothes moths? Vacuuming and freezing the entire collection, I think, is not possible. Will traps eventually reduce the population if they're used regularly? Do you know what was done in this case, or what should be done? A whole collection is infested. Um, vacuuming and freezing isn't possible. Um, will traps, well, traps will, will help, but it, it's the larval stage that is eating, eating the, the things. It, it's not the adult stage. Um, and the larvae are kind of hiding in your collection. They're, I, I'm not sure what your items are, but if it's fabrics, you know, they're likely to be, you know, in, in uh, not obvious locations, like in pockets or under collars or, you know, on the edges of rugs. And, you know, the vacuuming and freezing are, you know, some of the best ways of, of dealing with clothes moths rather than relying on just trapping, uh, even pheromone trapping, um, just because you have to kind of go where the pests are and these kind of pests are likely to be hiding. And you, you're really going to have to go through and find them if you really want to you know, have some kind of control. Uh, uh, but I'll be talking a little bit more about that you know, further in this um, slideshow. Um, and it I just wanted to get through a few mm -hmm. more um, things, and then we'll get back to those. Um, in that 11-step process, that the number one that Carol started talking about was the pest management objection, objectives for the site. And you know, number one, I'm thinking for the people listening in here, are that you want to keep pests away from your museum objects, because you want to keep them 
test free if at all possible. Materials need the most protection, meaning mostly organic objects. And um, you also want to keep your buildings as pest free as possible inside so that your collections aren't at risk. Um, another um, site management objective, in, at least in the national parks, and I'm sure all uh, museums would be, any pests that happen to be a public health threat would need immediate attention. Like if you had an infestation of um, mice or um, you know wasps at the entrance to your museum, something like that. So I, I just wanted to touch on that. That's number one of the 11 steps. Going back to uh, step four, Carol started talking about knowing your resource. Again, um, know what your most vulnerable materials are in the collection. Again, the organic materials. And I've, I've noticed that uh, protein-based materials like wool and taxidermy specimens and feathers and things like that seem to be a bit more vulnerable to pests than cellulose, uh, although cellulose is also um, vulnerable. And um, I guess uh, when you're assessing your museum objects and your historic structures, um, know the importance of the of the objects. Like, are are they original or are, are they reproductions or are they voucher specimens for um, natural history collections, which which are very important. You want to provide your most valuable things with the most um, secure protection, uh, especially in museum storage. Those are the things you want to be sure are in sealed museum cabinets and things like that. Um, and the ecology of the site, um, Carol was talking about the like the microclimates um, and the places where pests can hide. Um, I interject one more item here? Certainly. On the site description and the ecology of the site, um, you have to really know where your utilities are, your heating system. Um, where's the basement? Where are the pipe wall junctions? The you know electrical lines going in and out because those are access points for critters, and they know their access points because they they feel air going through them if it's not a tight seal. Like sometimes you'll have plumbers who will put in a pipe, and then there's like you know a huge diameter around there where you can almost put your finger through, and that's a great access point for mice or other critters. So again, you really need to know your site. Um, history and exactly everything that's going on on that little site and the people you work with. Thanks, Barbara. Yeah, and who, who's using it? Is the lunch is the employee lunch room right next to the exhibits? You know, those are things that you have to think about also because IPM is a very interrelated um, process, and you have to think like the pests. You have to think like what are they looking for, where do they like to hide, where are they coming in. And that's why um, step five, identifying pests, um, is very important. Um, you have to, if you can identify the pest, then you can learn, um, you know, is it a museum pest for one thing? Um, and museum pests, can be not only insects that we're talking about today, but they, they're also microorganisms or vertebrates, like you know, mice, rats, birds, and things like that. Um, anyway, uh, uh, um, one thing I want to add to on this, on the pest you know, definition, we think of things that are actually damaging our items, but sometimes they're just perimeter invaders that just happen to wander on in, and they're not really trying to eat any of your items. They just happen to get in the building looking for a cool space to hang out. But they can become a source for domestic beetles or other protein feeding items. So that's why it's important to monitor and have a tight chip. Yeah, and a pest, um, an organism that jeopardizes your site objective, uh, in our case, 
The site objective would be the preservation of historic or natural resources and uh, like public education through your interpreted museum collections. So that's why um, these kind of things are pests to us. And um, so that's why we're becoming familiar with the museum pests and the damage they do. And you want to know about um, their biology, and that can tell you how to manage them. Like, are they attracted to light or repelled by light? And sometimes for our museum pests, if the uh, adult stage would be attracted to light, and the larval stage would be avoiding light, such as with uh, dermestids or carpet beetles. You want to know, you know, how high they fly, what's their life, life cycle and reproduction, what are their food preferences, um, uh, you know, what um, if it's a wood boring pest, um, become familiar with their um, exit holes and frass to figure out what kind of pest you're dealing with. Um, and then are, are they particularly stigmotactic, meaning do they, most insects and rodents like to run with their bodies up against a, a surface like a wall. But some insects are even more stigmotactic, and like silverfish and cockroaches and dermestid larvae, they like to squeeze into little cracks and crevices and corrugations and corrugated boxes and things like that. So, um, and you can al always get help identifying insects from uh, people like your state cooperative extension office entomologists, and, and there's a lot of really good reference books available now. So, let's see. Um, I, so we're, we're kind of dividing the insect pests based on what they eat in your collection. So we have things like protein eaters, which would be like um, what, what's pictured here are the life cycles on top of the black carpet beetle from the smaller larva. And then they, as they grow, the larva shed their skin several times until they pupate into an adult. That's what it's showing there. Cellulose eaters. And I'm going to be talking about these in the next few pictures, too. Um, and uh, wood borers, uh, things that feed on mold, like um, um, book lice and springtails and things like that. Things that feed on starch, like um, silverfish and fire brats. And then omnivores, things that eat everything, like uh, cockroaches and crickets. Um, my, my favorite are the protein eaters. <laughs> They're the ones uh, that I deal with a lot in my work and in my building. I have, uh, in the middle of the picture, I have um, pictured the larva and the adult of the varied carpet beetle. And that's the big pest in my building. They've kind of been here since the beginning. And they, um, all these kind of pests, um, they, they eat museum objects like um, feathers, wool, silk, um, um, horn, taxidermy, insect collections, leather, hair, you know, skin products, things like that. So they are a big problem in museums. Um, and then the clothes moths are shown on top. Uh, those are webbing clothes moths. And uh, you know, it shows them the, the larva, the adult, and also the frass, and then, then also the holes that they're making. This is Carol. I wanted to interject something about the frass. We mentioned earlier that it's the excrement, or in wood critters, it's excrement plus what they dig out of the wood. Um, and the frass is really important. If you folks 
are responsible for managing museum items, which you are, you really should start a FRAS collection. Um, Barbara's got a great damage collection and a FRAS collection, and I've got a great FRAS collection too. And um, maybe when we get to the wood pest, we can pop up the termite FRAS later you on. You want me to? Okay. Yeah, well, I guess we do a uh, wood section, and we'll pop up that in a minute. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to kind of rush through this a little bit because we're getting short on time. But anyway, um, the uh, clothes moths and the dermestid beetles, which include carpet beetles and hide beetles, they're the only creatures that can actually digest keratin that's in your hair and your horn. And that's their function in nature is to decompose that when you know there's dead animals out in the woods. Um, but they're very, very serious damaging museum pests. And um, spider beetles also were um, the protein, protein eaters like that, too. And identifying damage, um, I have a few pictures showing this kind of typical grazing where they'll like eat the surface off of an object before they actually burrow in and make a hole. And it, um, more often, it's the clothes moths rather than the dermestid beetles that do this grazing. And uh, uh, the top, the top picture is a, um, a uh, like a suede glove that has um, grazing and case make cases from case making clothes moths. Um, the middle is a felted wool hat, and then there's uh, sheep skin, feathers, and then. In the middle of the bottom, there's tunneling from a, a hide beetle that that has damaged a Civil War cartridge box. And at the bottom, there's a Civil War woolen hat that's been grazed by clothes moths. Um, uh, the Park Service at one time had a lot of freeze-dried animals in their exhibits back in the 80s instead of conventional taxidermy. And they were even more susceptible to the clothes moths and carpet beetles. And this one exhibit, um, the three pictures on the left were in one wetlands exhibit. And these items were just totally destroyed and crawling with insects. And uh, the picture of the little wood mouse on the bottom um, was eaten from the inside out with case-making clothes moths. And it looked like the little critter was eating a strand of spaghetti, but it was actually cases of clothes moths coming out of its mouth. And also the, the Dungeness crabs were freeze-dried, and they had become infested by both clothes moths and carpet beetles. Something yeah, I want to add one item on the freeze-dried critters. We had learned through that experience that um, it's not good to freeze-dry anything larger than like a squirrel because the meat doesn't ever really freeze. So it's best to taxidermy the larger animals. And we're not using those freeze-dried specimens in any future exhibits in the Park Service. Um, I have another picture showing some more um, damage to uh, a wool uniform on top. and. Um, an insect collection in a museum was totally destroyed by um, buried carpet beetles. And picture over to the right, I have a little pointer showing one of the shed larval skins of a carpet beetle. And that's one of the, um, the signs of, of, um, to look for when you're trying to identify pest damage. And the feather below um, has again, has the frass and cases from case-making clothes moths. Um, I think I skipped one. I, I did want to talk about the cellulose eaters. They eat things like um, herbarium collections, um, basketry, paper, and things like that. And um, those include insects like cigarette beetles, drugstore beetles. Um, grain beetles and grain moths of various types. And I have a picture showing an, a museum exhibit that had real dried corn in it. And that exhibit became infested with Anguamus grain moths. And so that's why we don't 
uh, we, we do recommend against uh, having any real food or grain material in museum exhibits. Um, it's just a close-up of an uh, herbarium uh, specimen that was damaged by drugstore beetles. And you can see the holes in the item and the frass. Um, I've also seen live infestations of cigarette beetles and also even book lice in herbarium collections. Once you really get in and inspect with a waking light, with a flashlight, you can even see book lice, which are very, very, very tiny little insects. So you really have to do inspections. We just have, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we just have about 10 minutes left. I was wondering if we could answer some of the questions that were in the chat box, or do you, Okay. is, is that a right, or do you want to go through one or two more of these before we, we just have a, a couple of questions backed up there. Okay, so let me, tell me what the questions are. Well, there's, I saw two that were sort of similar. Are ants and are fleas considered museum pests? What's that ants? I don't see the fleas. 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 Um, uh, the, the only ants or fleas that actually feed on museum materials would be carpenter ants that would feed on wood. Or live in wood, excavate Live wood. in wood. But, but you can find ants in your collections. And um, it's good to it's, identify your ant, because some are protein feeders and some are not. Mm -hmm. So it means they're getting in to feed on something. So use them as a, a clue that something's going on. OK, mm -hmm. OK. And then the, here's a question. If you were starting from scratch, what recommendations do you have to prepare a new temporary storage area off-site in preparation for an emergency collections move of a mixed collection? Okay. And that, it, that oh, feeds into a, a different question we had. Yeah. Well, um, I, I would always make it um, you know, as well sealed as possible. Um, I, I guess we can post later. Um, I, I have a good information sheet on, on things when you're building a new museum storage area, things to build in from an IPM point of view. And I can make a point of having that posted to the site afterwards. OK, great. We can start that um, as a but, discussion topic. But it, temporary, you want to make sure you start out as clean as possible. <coughs> Excuse me. You might compartmentalize things that are similar as well. Um, and I, I think Barbara's reference states that. Uh, I did see one of the questions earlier said they were starting out with a 30,000 foot mm -hmm. building. That was my next one, yeah. Right, and, and that's a huge task. I think the first thing I do is get blueprints and figure out where your, where your duct work is and where your in and outs are on the building access points, and then figure out where you're going to put different types of items, what type of shelving. Um, I've seen pretty low budget places where they have um, don't don't have the money for museum storage cases, but they'll put leg items together and then they'll use uh, uh, different types of plastic to shelf manage shelves as mini storage areas, um, kind of draping plastic around them so that they're they can actually create microhabitats and keep it drier in certain areas for different types of materials. Um, I think you would recommend sort of attacking all the problems at once then of, of the different well, kinds uh, of prioritizing, like, like Bob okay. said in the beginning. You've got to prioritize what your items are. If you've got protein or you've got cellulose items, um, that's the priority. And those should get your most attention and, and monitoring. And the more barrier layers you can put between the outside and, and the, pe the, the object and the pest, the better. That's why we recommend. Um, museum storage cabinets with the good gasketing. Always put your most vulnerable material in, in that kind of um, sealed environment. The one question about fleas, too, I wanted to just address that real quick. If you have fleas, that means something's living in the building, or there's birds and the bats in the attic, or raccoons, or something getting in somewhere in some of the ductwork, or between the walls. You don't want fleas in the building. First of all, if the animal dies in there, whatever the host is, you're going to have a domestic beetle issue feeding on them. And you'll have an odor issue, which is even worse. Um, but fleas do carry bubonic plague. And uh, you, you just don't want fleas in the building. That means something's going on. They're another indicator. Okay. Um, I, I just wanted to show you the, the slide of the kind of damage that silverfish do. It, 
again, it starts out as kind of a grazing, and they actually eat paper. Their, their favorite thing is eating starch, so that you, you find them in uh, books and book bindings. But they, they like coated papers. And um, so the, these pictures show, the, the one on the left shows that they've actually been eating an instruction sheet from a fumigation chamber, which is interesting. And on the right, uh, they've actually been eating um, copies of museum um, catalog cards. And they have a really fine frass that's uh, brown and elongated, but very fine. So if you see that kind of, you know, about the width of a human hair type Brass that might be from silverfish. Um, I've seen them on uh, a whole set of Thomas Jefferson bind, uh, books where they ate the binding. Uh, mm -hmm. They like the, the starch. Um, uh, for, for wood destroying insects, um, wood borers and powder post beetles and things like that, um, the larva spends most of their life tunneling through the wood, so often the only thing you're looking, you're able to see at a, most of the year is their exit holes or their, or the frass coming out of them. And we have on this site um, a, a good sheet where you can identify the kind of insect it is from the dam from the, um, actually the signs of damage that they do. And it's important to identify them so you know whether that species is likely to reinfest the same wood again. Um, That's uh, the page on the exit holes, Elsa, if you want to yeah, that sure. up at this. We um, are almost at time. Um, well, first of all, I can quickly mention this. What you're looking at here is dry wood termite frass. And I wanted to, if you look at real hard and blow it up a little, you can see that each pellet is six-sided. So normal subterranean termites that we're all familiar with, most of us are, do not create ferrous like this. They're, this is unique to the drywood western termite or drywood termites. They don't need a moisture source, so they're really difficult to manage. Um, pretty much the only way to manage them is fumigation or completely seal them out of the building. Uh, so they're, they're, I put it in because it's a real distinct critter. They, they withdraw as much water as they can out of the pellet before they pop the fecal pellet out. Kind of a dead giveaway. Yeah, and I saw a question on diatomaceous earth. Um, that, it, that is one of the low-risk um, kind of pesticides that you can use as a crack and crevice treatment for um, museum areas. Uh, these low-risk pesticidal dusts like diatomaceous earth, boric acid, or silica aerogel are, are things that that are pretty safe to use, and they are effective on many of the museum pests if they come into contact with them. Oops. Oh, but anybody else but my screen went blank. <laughs> yeah, mine too. Okay. I guess we're out. Um, I see your question, Vicki. Um, we will be posting a list of resources that have been discussed here. Uh, there is a discussion page on the connectingtocollections.org webpage. And um, we can continue having our conversation there. And also, I will be posting as many of the links as I've been able to capture. I think I've gotten pretty much all of them. OK, um, and I'll go ahead and I'll let you post the rest of the pictures um, from my slideshow. Oh, OK. Um, OK. OK, you did. Yeah, thank thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Sorry that we've gotten close to pretty much run out of time here, but they've been some great questions, and I hope it's been helpful for everyone that came here and participated today. I've posted a link to an evaluation, and um, I'm hoping that you'll take the time to go look at it and let us know your thoughts about this um, webinar. We would like to know what you think worked, and um, if you have any advice or further questions, we'd be happy to respond to those. So. I want to thank Barbara and Carol so much for taking the time to be here and answer these questions. You're welcome. Thank you to Learning Times and uh, ASLH and the IMLS 
and um, I hope that you will join us for our next webinar. It's going to be on August the 2nd, and um, we're going to be, it's another, with this partnership with the uh, National Park Service, Teresa Ann Vollinger is going to be speaking to us about cold storage for photographic materials. Um, and there will be more information there and on our Facebook page and on our website. So thanks very much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.